Hey guys, I'm your host, Tara A. Devlin, and welcome to this week's episode of Kowabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. My latest book, Kowabana Volume 12, is now out. Collecting even more of your favourite stories from the show, you can find creepy ghosts, abandoned buildings, haunted shrines, fascinating monsters, and much, much more. You can find that on Amazon right now, and help support the show at the same time. This week, we're looking at stories of terrifying encounters that leave those involved change forever. And perhaps not for the better. First up, a group of friends go to stay in a cottage by the beach, but something they see there will seriously make them question their own sanity. Find out what in Land on the Coast. This happened when I was in my final year of high school. One of my friend's parents owned a cottage by the sea in Ibaraki Prefecture, so six of us decided to spend some time there during the summer. We transferred from the Joban line to a local line, then once we arrived at the station, we went to a small supermarket outside and bought about five days worth of food. Then, after a 30 minute taxi ride, we finally arrived at the cottage. There wasn't even a single shop in the area at the time. The cottage was only about 50 square metres, but we were still excited by the size of it. It was well past midday when we finally arrived, but we immediately ran for the beach anyway to play. On the morning of the second day there, we went straight back to the beach and hung out there all day, not going back to the cottage until that evening. We were exhausted. There was no telephone there, but there was electricity, so we put the TV on and watched it in a daze. We saw news about Flight 123 crashing into Mount Osutaka, but that doesn't have anything to do with this story, so I won't go further into it. We were absorbed in the news, but we were also so exhausted that at some point we fell asleep, and next thing I knew, it was the morning of the third day. We were still pretty tired the next morning, so we didn't hit the beach until that afternoon. We didn't hang around for too long, however, and before long we returned to the cottage. As the sun set, we lit some fireworks and then snuck into the nearby forest to look around for a bit. But then we returned to the cottage once more and decided to go to bed early, so we could hit the beach again the next morning. I was lying on the bed, chatting about this and that as I tried to fall asleep when Suddenly, H muttered something. Do you hear that? I don't hear anything. Me neither. A few people chimed in, but H insisted that he could hear something. Before long, G agreed. I can hear it too. Something outside, like something sliding across the grass. Oh, come on now. Don't try to scare us, we joked. Listening carefully, a hush fell over the room. Wait, I really can hear something, someone muttered. But at that point, I still couldn't hear anything myself. All I could hear was the faint sound of the wind moving through the grass and trees. Can you still hear it? I asked no one in particular. I can. Then there was a dull thud, like a knock at the door. Everyone jumped in surprise. Seemed we all heard that. Hey, the door's locked, right? The friend who was lying closest to the door got up and ran to check. Yeah, it's locked, he said. We all sighed in relief. We all wondered if maybe it was a thief. I think anyone would think the same thing. Kay, the guy whose parents owned the cottage, then pulled a stick out from somewhere. We didn't hear the thud at the door again, but everyone remained nervous. There's definitely something crawling around in the grass, H said. Someone turned a light on and relief seemed to fill the room. Hey, somebody go take a look, Kay said. Nobody responded. Let's turn the TV on, someone else said. Light filled the room, followed by voices. It was close to midnight. 
Everyone agreed we should go back to bed with the TV on, so we crawled back under the covers with the lights and sounds filling the room. There weren't many late night broadcasts at the time, but on this particular night, the TV was filled with news of the plane crash the day before, so we avoided nothing but white noise. No one mentioned the strange noises again after that, and eventually we fell asleep. The next morning, we went outside to look around and found an area of grass about a meter wide that had been trampled. Not only that, but all the grass in that area had turned white. Well, maybe not turned white exactly, but it was like all the color had drained from it. I was tempted to go home early, but the taxi wouldn't be arriving until midday the following day. So, seeing as it was practically the last day already, I decided to stick it out and go swimming instead. As I said earlier, there were no phones, and of course we didn't have cell phones at the time either, so the only way to contact anyone was to walk an hour to the nearest store. But honestly, if we had gone, then we might have avoided the horror that followed. Sadly, it was cloudy that day, But once we reached the beach, we forgot about everything. We swum and sunbathed and hung out until five in the evening. Then we returned to the cottage and cleaned up the remaining food, except for breakfast the following day. Before long, the sun went down. We played with the remaining fireworks, and because everyone was exhausted, we decided to go to bed early again. We each washed up, laid out the blankets, and then went to bed. Of course, we left the lights and TV on, although there weren't any interesting programs playing. Again, we chatted about this and that, and right as we were drifting off to sleep, suddenly, the lights went out. The lights in the cottage were incandescent, rather than fluorescent, so it wasn't that strange. But what was odd was that two of them, rather far from each other, went out at the exact same time. (sighs) We all screamed, but the TV was still on, so I wasn't that worried. We tried turning the lights back on, but they refused. Do you have any spare bulbs? Someone asked. No, we should have bought some. Well, it was too late for that now. The only light in the room came from the TV, and for some reason, everyone was silent. I can hear it again. H suddenly muttered. Listening closer, this time I could hear something too. It was like something rolling or sliding across the grass at intervals. Hey, turn the TV up! The noise of the TV got louder, but still I could clearly hear that other noise. It wasn't human. I think everyone thought the same thing. And then, even more unluckily, the television programs for the night ended. Unlike how it is today, TV channels didn't run all night back then. Once programming ended, the screen would switch to white noise and a constant buzzing. But that sound was so creepy that, in the end, we decided to mute it. The strange sound outside continued unabated. Then, suddenly, we heard a dull thud again. This time, it was coming from beneath the floor. It wasn't just once, though. It continued at regular intervals. Suddenly, H stood up, silently opened the door, and ran outside. Hey, where are you going? Get back here! We all screamed, but he continued running without turning around. The only sound was the hollow echo of the door as it closed behind him. Several minutes passed. H still hadn't returned. Shouldn't we go check on him? At that point, the noise had stopped. All we could hear was the faint sound of the wind. With torches in hand, the remaining five of us went outside. H was sitting about 10 meters from the door. As we got closer, for some reason he was sitting and shaking his head slightly from side to side. We grabbed his sides and forced him to his feet, then carried him back to the cottage, but the whole time, 
He said nothing. He just kept shaking his head. What happened? What's wrong? No matter what we asked, he just kept shaking his head. Next thing I knew, I heard that noise outside again. An indescribable fear crept over me. Hey, screw you, man! Kay screamed. He grabbed the stick and a torch and then went back outside. G and two others followed him. I stayed back with our other friend to watch over H. Outside, Kay shouted. What on earth is going on? I thought. So I left H with my other friend and went outside to check. The moment I opened the door, G came back. All colour had drained from his face. What's wrong? G didn't answer. He just fell to the ground and sat there. Without hesitation, I ran outside. A few metres from the door, I screamed before I could stop myself. Several tiny people, only 20 or 30 centimetres high, were pulling something like a parade float. They were pulling it over the grass. Something black. What a strange sight. These tiny people were silently pulling something black and it made a creepy noise as it moved over the grass. I realised the black thing was countless insect carcasses, and then I passed out. When I woke up the next morning, I was sitting against the outside wall of the cottage. G was by the front door. K was in the grass next to him. The other two who had followed K were sitting next to him, and our other friend, the one who was looking after H, was still inside the cottage. But H was nowhere to be seen. Once we'd gathered ourselves, the five of us started looking for H, starting with the area around the cottage. We must have looked for about 30 minutes, but we couldn't find him anywhere. We had no choice but to report him missing to the police, so two of our friends stayed behind, while the rest of us started walking to get to a phone. As we passed the forest, I heard a rustling sound inside. No way, I thought, and ran inside. And there H was. He was frantically piling stones into a tower. At any rate, we were all able to return home after that. When I asked H about it later, he said he went into the forest to look around and when he saw a pile of stones, he kicked it over for fun. But until we called out to him, he wasn't in his right mind. The next thing he knew, he was trying to rebuild the stone tower. But that was all he would say on the matter. H is still alive today, but he doesn't really socialise with people anymore. He's become the entire opposite of how he used to be. I wonder if maybe he broke some sort of seal in the forest that time. Next, a kid finds a secret passage in his grandparents' house while playing hide-and-seek, but it ends up leading him somewhere he never expected. Find out where in... Hole. This happened when I was a child and went to visit my grandmother's house. I started playing hide-and-seek with my older sister and two cousins, who were around the same age as me. The cousin who was just one year younger than me was the one who had to find us. We always played hide and seek whenever we went to my grandmother's house, so I knew all the good spots. In the cardboard box on top of the chest of drawers, beneath the shoe boxes near the front door, etc. And I often used them, so it was hard to find a new spot that the others didn't know yet. I was good at hiding and often the last one found, so I started looking for an even better spot this time. Suddenly, I noticed the closet in the altar room. I climbed to the top and looked up and saw a gap just a few millimetres wide in the boards up there. I pushed it, and it moved. So I crawled up, put the board back, and then looked around. Light was coming in from outside, and it looked more like I was in a tunnel than in the roof. It was like 
a long hallway. Grandma's house was a long, narrow, single-story house, and it seemed like this passage went from one end to the other. It was only large enough for an adult to barely crawl through. I thought they might find me if I stayed near the closet, so I decided to move down the passage a little. It was an old house, full of gaps, and it wasn't very dark, so I wasn't afraid. I crawled on all fours, and as I was about to reach the other end of the house, suddenly the floor beneath me gave way, the boards broke, and I fell head first to the ground. I landed on a bunch of old, dusty blankets and such, so thankfully I wasn't heard, but something was weird. This was no room I'd ever seen in my grandma's house. I looked up to where I'd fallen from, but it was rather high up, and judging by the distance, this would be something like a basement. I was surrounded by dirt and stone. I looked around for something that could get me back to where I fell from, and found a switch. I pressed it, and then a bare light bulb with a cord hanging from it lit up. With the light, I could finally see. There was a giant hole in the wall before me. I thought it would be impossible to get back to the ceiling, but if I crawled through this new hole, I'd end up somewhere. So I went inside. The ground was covered in more blankets, just like a room. It was damp and kind of creepy, and I was starting to get more and more afraid, but I kept going until the light no longer reached me. The tunnel seemed to be going slightly uphill, and although I was tired, I kept going. Then, suddenly, I hit the end. It seemed to be a thin plywood board covering the way, but Once I pushed past that, I was free. Or I should have been, but I found myself in a room I'd never seen before. There was a large wooden grate or lattice or something with a large lock, so I was unable to get out. I couldn't take it anymore and screamed. Then I heard a woman's voice on the other side of the cage. Is somebody in there? I don't know how I got here. Somebody, help me. Hold on. There was a clattering sound, and then a door opened. I seemed to be in a small room in a storehouse. Oh, I I don't have the key for that room. Hold on a minute. Before long, an old man appeared. He looked at me strangely as he rattled the lock, pulling on it and such, but it wouldn't open. He then grabbed an axe and smashed it, letting me out. He asked me my name and where I was from. I told him that I found a hole in my grandmother's house and then I ended up here. He then carried me back. Both my grandparents were surprised when they saw the old man carrying me home. I was supposed to be playing inside. I explained how he saved me and they looked troubled but thanked him. He said he passed through some hole and ended up in the storehouse, the old man said. But as soon as he did, my grandparents screamed at him to get out and chased him off. I felt bad about everything, so I explained to my grandfather about what happened. I went into the closet in the altar room. There was a hole that connected to that old man's place and I went in there without asking. It wasn't his fault. There's no way it connected that far, my grandfather screamed. He went into the altar room and then covered the hole with a bunch of boards and nails. I was too scared to ask about the tunnel after that, so I still have no idea what it was. Apparently, an old lady used to live in that house I ended up in. She didn't socialize much and she passed away there. And then the elderly couple that helped me moved in, so they didn't know much about the storehouse either. That old man passed away long ago, and his wife also passed away a few years ago, so other people are living in that house. I recently asked my parents about it, but they said they didn't know anything either. What on earth was all that? The bedding, 
the light, the tunnel. It's kind of scary to think about, so I try not to think about it too much now. The man in this next story buys a cactus to decorate his new place, but after talking to it, it seems to wither and die. What's really going on? Find out in Heart-Shaped Cactus. I had been living with my girlfriend for about a month. The room was decorated with knickknacks and such that she chose, and although it was just a cheap single-room apartment, she made it into a fashionable little love nest. Honestly, I was beyond happy with things. On the way home from work, I passed a florist with all sorts of colourful flowers on display, and it hit me that we didn't have a single plant in our apartment. Still, I thought it would be a waste if I bought something nice and it just died in a week or so. So, I picked a small, heart-shaped cactus and took it home with me. My girlfriend's expression didn't change when I showed it to her, and although I was a little sad, I went to place it by her bedside. It was heart-shaped, after all. But she immediately told me, no, and put it by our shoes at the front door. She was rather strict about what could and couldn't be in the house. Six months passed. I saw a program on TV that said, if you talk to plants in a positive, cheerful way, it helps them grow. It sounded stupid, but I was tired and having problem after problem at work. Things at home had also gotten pretty stale, so I wanted to try something fresh and new. Almost unconsciously, I went to the cactus by the shoes and spoke to it. You can do this. You're doing great. Are you stupid? My girlfriend said with a laugh. But it made me feel a little better, so each morning I started talking to it. But before long, it started to turn brown and wither, and about 10 days after I first started talking to it, it died. Maybe talking to it made me feel more attached to the plant, and although I didn't quite cry over it, I was still sad. I guess it wasn't meant to be, my girlfriend said, and then got rid of it. The following week, I once again bought a heart-shaped cactus and took it home. I spoke to it before bed, but when I looked at it the next morning, it had started to wither. I guess it really isn't meant to be, I said, feeling sad first thing in the morning. I had to take the trash downstairs and also visit the convenience store, so I left the apartment early. You can do this, I said to the cactus as I left but I didn't get far before I noticed my shoes were coming apart at the bottom, so I quickly returned. I was already upset about the cactus, so I threw my broken shoes in the bin and then made my way to the toilet before leaving again. When I got out, I heard the door open and then close. It seemed my girlfriend had returned. My shoes weren't at the front door, so she must have thought I'd left for work already. The toilet was by the front door, so I thought about swinging the door open as she walked past to scare her, but as I held my breath, I heard her muttering something, but no footsteps. You're so useless. Just die already. Waste of space. It was my girlfriend's voice. Wondering if she was having a bad day, I stepped out of the toilet normally. I didn't know what she was doing at first, but she seemed to be holding a tiny bottle and was pouring something onto the cactus. When our eyes met, she immediately hid what she was holding. What are you doing? Huh? Oh, just fertilizing it. She looked surprised to see me. It's nutrients. At work that day, I tried telling myself that she really was just fertilizing it. But when I got home and saw the cactus looked even worse, I lost it. In the end, it turned out she didn't like the tacky thing I'd chosen to put in the apartment, 
but she gave in and let me. Her words. But then she couldn't stand watching me talk to such a tacky thing like that every day, so she decided to kill it. It didn't make any sense to me. Honestly, I saw myself spending the rest of my life with her, so I tried to look at it as a simple weak point. But the more I thought about it, the more it creeped me out. So a month later, I broke up with her. Like, if you don't like something, you should just say it, and not go to such lengths to get around it, you know? A group of friends visit an empty building near their school for a test of courage in this next story, but their choices that night will haunt them forever. Find out why in Ogiso. When I was in elementary school, I did a test of courage at an agricultural school with my friends A and B. B and I were just regular people, but A seemed to have a sixth sense, not to mention a cute childhood friend, so he was no ordinary guy. He was the type to always take the lead and get involved in all sorts of strange happenings, and the story I'm going to tell you about this time is something scary that happened to us at school. The agricultural school was massive. Although it was in the countryside, there was a station and residential area nearby. The area around the school was strangely full of dense forest, and when we were out doing practical stuff in the fields, it kind of felt like we were in Hokkaido or something. All you could see were grassy fields. I guess the school first opened when the town was just being developed. Sometimes I'd take a shortcut through the university on my way home from school, but passing through the dark, empty fields on my way home was pretty scary for me at the time. Anyway, A chose an old concrete building at school as the site of our test of courage. It was situated in the forest near the practical fields, across the grounds from the other school buildings and dorms. We had no idea what the building was used for. There was a wooden sign on the front door, but it was so badly weathered that we couldn't read what was on it. The glass was broken in various places, and it was boarded up as well. Some parts were open though, and we could just barely see into the darkness inside. We decided to spend the night at A's house, and then sneak over there. A's family stupidly tolerated his behaviour, but looking back on it now, they probably should have stopped him. We entered the forest from the side of the school, crossed the stream, and then entered the practical fields. The only light we had was A's torch, but the moon was full above us. As we pushed our way through the grass, chatting about this and that on the way to the building, A suddenly said something. Is somebody following us? I stopped and looked around, but I didn't see anyone else in the grass. I didn't think anyone would follow us at school, so I told myself it was probably just a stray cat or something. But I did see what looked like a strange green light in the forest. I didn't say anything because I didn't want my friends to think I was scared. At any rate, we arrived at the building without issue. The front door was tightly shut, and the windows were covered in boards, so we wondered what to do. A then suggested we go around the back. There were some emergency stairs there. We went up and found ourselves on the roof. There were two emergency exits, one of which was unlocked and half open. Once inside, we found ourselves on the second floor. This second floor overlooked an auditorium. The building seemed to be divided into five floors with the auditorium on the second, the entrance in the middle and another room nearby. We went down to check the auditorium, but there wasn't really much there other than some steel chairs. We were laughing and joking about how this place wasn't so scary, but then we noticed the door in the middle was open. A said that wasn't open when he previously came here and because he hadn't yet been inside, we decided to check it out. The entrance hall had boxes to put shoes in, and that was it. 
Further in, we found a room full of desks. The place was a mess. It wasn't like the desks had been neatly put there, but rather, it was like they'd all been shoved to the back to make room for cleaning or something. There were also dirty magazines everywhere, and a bad smell in the air. The magazines were all fetish stuff, what I guess you'd call lolly these days. A and I were little brats, so we forgot why we were there and happily started reading. B, who wasn't interested in such things, looked around the room with the torch, bored. I'm not sure how much time passed, but B suggested we should go home now, and then we heard a creepy snarl somewhere in the distance. It's Ogiso, B said. At the time, it sounded like a monster name, but in reality, it was just the name of a disabled person who lived nearby. I didn't know anything about the person, but judging by the tone in B's voice, I understood that we didn't want to run into him. Still, we were in a building, so while we were scared, it wasn't over yet. Let's keep reading these until he disappears, I said to B, using the opportunity to keep reading. But things went worse than expected. Ogiso's voice didn't get further away. In fact, it started getting closer. Then we heard the doorknob on the floor above us being turned. He was trying to open another door. We shrank in fear, and all we could do was turn the torch off and remain silent. Luckily, it seemed he didn't have the key, because the door refused to open. But the strange voice didn't stop. And yes, that's right. The other door that we came through, that one was still open too. Holding our breaths, we looked for somewhere to hide. Now that we were here, there was no escape. There was nowhere to hide amongst the desks. We had to hide somewhere else on the second floor. Just like the auditorium, the second floor was built so that it overlooked that room full of desks. We wanted to escape, but the door Ogiso was trying to open was blocked by a bunch of stuff. We hid in that corner, making ourselves small and holding our breath. There were no shadows we could hide in though, so if he looked inside, he would immediately see us. Finally, his voice entered the room. We could see torchlight on the ceiling. Of course, it wasn't ours. It was Ogiso. Is he looking for us? I thought, almost in tears. We remained silent and tried not to breathe too loudly either. Ogiso seemed to be working on something downstairs. We could hear him violently kicking a chair and doing something or other. Suddenly, we heard another cry. This time it was a girl who was maybe around the same age as us. She was crying and, looking back on it now, she was probably screaming for help. It sounded like he was punching and kicking something and other scary noises down there but we were far too scared to go and check. In the end, all we could do was listen to their voices for hours on end, although I think partway through the girl stopped. I don't know how much time passed after that, but eventually Ogiso started to move again. Just as he did on the way in, he kicked things and furiously rattled doorknobs. His voice gradually got further away, and then he passed by where we were hiding, on the second floor, onto the roof. At first, we didn't move. It seemed like a trap, and so we remained there for quite some time. Then, finally, we fell asleep. When I woke up, sunlight was coming through the gaps of the boarded window. It was morning. We no longer heard Ogiso's voice, so we finally stood up and went downstairs. The area was covered in blood. That was it. We didn't know where the girl was. All three of us threw up on the spot. It left a bad aftertaste, like we were the ones who had done something wrong. In the end, we made it home safe and sound, and A's parents never said anything about us being gone either. 
I didn't hear much about Ogiso after that, and I never saw him either. That's why we decided to keep what happened a secret. But there was one program on TV that I'll never forget. It was the local news, which aired between other programs, and the announcer was talking about a girl our age who lived nearby that went missing. A young kid spots something strange coming down the mountain outside their house. But what is it? And what does it really want? Find out in... From the Mountain. My family home lies deep in the mountains, and if you walk just 20 metres from the house, you'll find the entrance to a mountain. When I was just a child, my parents told me not to go up there because it was dangerous, but I was still curious about it. Why wouldn't you be, right? And the bamboo looks like an arch, like a gateway to adventure, so, you know. But I was also a coward, so I made sure to never go there unless I was with my grandfather or grandmother. There were pit vipers and such around, so... Anyway, this is a story about something that came down from the mountain, not something that happened on it. I think I was in the fifth grade, and it was probably the summer holidays. I finished eating dinner, left the dining room that only had a fan in it, and then returned to my bedroom. I opened the window and looked outside. It was just after dark, maybe 7pm or so. The evening breeze was calm and cool. So I didn't even need an air conditioner. And so I sat there and watched the sky turn indigo. Then, something was coming down the mountain. It was shaped like a person, but something about it was different. People's skin has a colour, right? Even people with fair skin, you can tell they are pale and have black hair. But this was pure white from head to toe, and it was slowly walking. But it wasn't really walking either, it was kind of sliding, like it was coming down an escalator or something. Was it really a person? It was too white to be a person. Maybe it was the old guy next door, I thought. Hmm? If it was walking, then why wasn't its body moving? My mind flooded with questions as I watched it. Slowly, slowly, it came down the mountain. Then it perfectly hid in the shadows behind one of the trees in our yard. A thought suddenly hit me. If it comes out from there, it must be a human. All right, I'll stay right here and watch it. I stared, watching the shadow of that tree closely. Hmm? There was nothing white there. Why? I must have stared at that spot for five minutes straight. Nothing came out. There was no sign of anything moving. Oh. It must have actually been a monster then, I thought. And then suddenly I broke out in a sweat and ran to the rest of my family in the living room. For a while, I didn't want to go back to my room. But in the end, I had to go back there for bedtime. I couldn't stop thinking about how that thing might still be sitting there as I entered my room. But just like before, there was nothing there. It must have gone somewhere else, I thought. And it wasn't like there was much I could do about it either way, so I got into bed. So, that night. If you live in the countryside, then you no doubt understand, but most toilets are outside. It was kind of far, so going there at night was a little like a test of courage. I woke up needing to pee, and being that I was in the upper grades of elementary school, I couldn't exactly ask my grandparents to go with me. I made my way over by myself. Even though it was summer, it's still a little cool at night in the countryside. The moon was beautiful too. I didn't need any electric lights to see. I reached the toilet and 
As I was doing my business, I stared out the little window inside. Suddenly, I heard something. I didn't know what it was, but I could definitely hear something, like rustling. What on earth is that? I thought, and as I looked around, I saw that pure white thing. I had no idea what it was, but it was pure white in the moonlight. In the darkness, this pure white thing seemed to be crawling around on four legs. Was it a fox? A tanuki? No, it was far too big for that. A dog? A large dog, maybe? It was kind of far away, so I stared closely at it. Was that a tail? Something long seemed to keep appearing and disappearing from view but its head looked kind of funny. The rustling sound had to be from that, but what on earth was it? What was it saying? I pushed my fears aside and just watched it. The white thing had a cut on its body. Confused, I looked again. The cut healed. Another cut appeared, and then it healed. Maybe it was because of the grass, I thought. That had been freshly cut, so there was no way. Was it a new species? An alien? I kept watching it, but it didn't seem to notice me at all, and then slowly it started walking back towards the mountain. For just a moment, it looked in my direction. It had a human face. Its eyes were bright red, but there was no expression there. When I saw it, I wasn't afraid, but rather like, oh, I've seen something I shouldn't have. I went back to bed and didn't think much more of it, but when I woke up the next morning, I couldn't stop shaking in fear. Like, oh crap, I saw something seriously weird. My grandfather didn't believe in such things, so when I told him about it, he got angry. Don't be stupid he said. But then he also said something interesting. Long ago, there used to be a guardian deity enshrined on that mountain. Looking back on it now, I don't think that white thing came down to scare anyone, but rather it was like, hey, I'm still here, so don't worry. If it really was a mountain kamisama, then it was kind of creepy. But I think it was too cute to be some kind of monster as well. It's been several years since I moved away from home, and honestly, the things I've seen since living in the city are far more terrifying than that thing I saw in the mountains. Finally this week, a story with a bit of a conundrum. When a famous liar tells you a story, will you choose to believe it? Or find out what happens in The Famous Liar. We no longer see each other since we both moved, but I used to live next to a famous liar. He was a chatty guy who told all sorts of stories at bars. The stories were obviously questionable, and so He was famous around town for being a liar. This is one of the stories he told. So, people have near-death experiences, right? Stories of them have been published in all sorts of places. But they're all fake. Heaven and hell are real, and when you die, you go to one of them. It's decided the moment you die, and somebody will guide you to either heaven or hell. But sometimes there are people who don't necessarily have to be dead yet. And so, to those people, the guide will ask them a question. If you die now, you will go to heaven. However, you can also go back and continue living your life. What will you do? Apparently, those who are going to hell don't get the chance to come back to life. At any rate, most people choose to continue living. But there's a condition attached. You mustn't tell anyone about what happened on the other side. 
If you do, you'll go to hell. So, once you come back to life, you mustn't say anything. And now that I've told you what happened, I'm 100% going to hell. <laughs> it's hard to take a secret to the grave, isn't it? That's why the guide will tell you what to say in such cases. And when you hear people talking about their near-death experiences, that's what the guide told them to say. Once everything is completed on the other side, the guide will bring you back to our world. But on the way, they'll say something. You would have gone to heaven if you didn't choose to come back to life. To tell you the truth, it's a little troublesome having so many people in heaven, so that's why we do this. If people live long enough, they usually do something that will send them to hell. So, best of luck to you. I hope your fortunes don't change. That's why nobody tells you the truth. If you do, then you'll go to hell, and the person you spoke to will go to heaven. But then, doesn't that mean you only want to save yourself? And if so, wouldn't that mean you would actually go to hell? So then, if you choose to come back to life, it means you're going to hell either way. A huge thank you and shout out to this week's Kami Tier members, Christina, Just Sawn, and S Dash. It's thanks to your support, along with everyone else, that I'm able to keep doing this show, so thank you very much. Don't forget to check out Koabana Volume 12, out on Amazon right now, and check out our newly revamped merchandise store at koabana.store. And if you'd like to chat about this week's stories, come and join us in the Koabana Discord. You can find that link in the description or on koabana.net. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Tara A. Devlin for exclusive bonus stories and extras, or our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash koabana Japan for all sorts of Japanese horror you won't find anywhere else. Thanks guys, stay safe, and I'll see you again next time for even more koabana, true Japanese scary stories from around the internet. Want even more scary stories? Head over to koabana.net for new translations every week. You can also join our Patreon for exclusive stories you won't find anywhere else. Head over to koabana.net now.